Hey guys, how's it going? Come on, I'm excited to, uh, to, to be tackling this very easy uh, uh, <laughs> body of scripture tonight. Um, you know, we were talking about encounter and, uh, you know, the, we've been going through 1 Corinthians. This is our Church Under Fire sermon series and we're 11 chapters in per se. And uh, the reason why we um, drop water bottles, oh my gosh, no, I'm just kidding. No, it's fine. The reason... The reason why we, <laughs> so I call you out because I love you. Um, the reason why we go through the word of God, amen, is because we're Christians, yeah, you know, and, uh, and, and we believe that the word of God is, uh, is, is the plumb line. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's everything, you know, um, it's, it's the word of God. But it's also the word of God who is Jesus, amen? And when we read the word, it's uh, an opportunity for encounter. Every time we open the verse, you know, the, you got the verses where such and such begat such and such and such and such begat such and such, and you think, man, can, when can I skip to the good stuff, right? But, but then you read it, and that's a portal too. Every area where you open up the word is a portal. And, uh, you know, if you, if you take the moment, like I said last week, to look again at times, there's there's a huge depth of just encounter waiting to happen. So I'm excited because we're about to encounter Jesus through his word tonight. Um, so I'm excited because also this is probably one of uh, my last times preaching. Um, I'm going to be, you know, so, so whatever. We won't get into that. But I'm excited uh, to be speaking uh, before you guys. So it's going to be good. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so, so good. So I got to uh, cheat a little bit because I got to study Keith's message and Patty's message. And so really, this is just going to be a morphing between the two. I picked the best parts of Keith's and the best parts of Patty's, and uh, we should be good to go. I'm just kidding. I'm reading from the ESV today, so I'm going to switch it up. Um, I know, that's brave. Hey, come on. Um, so uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 16. Um, we're going to dip into one as well, um, and then I'm just going to pray and uh, see what God wants to do. So, Lord, I just thank you. <sighs> I thank you for your presence. I thank you, God, that even though I feel very uh, whacked, as they say right now, I, uh, when we are under your influence, God, that you cause us to, uh, to operate at a level that isn't even... Um, registered on human levels, that we operate on a higher level because we surrender to you. So Lord, we surrender our levels to you tonight. We just say, take us where you want to take us, uh, speak to us what you want to say to us. And I pray, God, that, uh, you know, all the stuff that is me, like Pastor Keith said this morning, will be set aside and, and that you, uh, what you have embedded in this message would really shine forth and, uh, and plant in, uh, in good soil that it would bear good fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's dive into Scripture. So it says uh, in verse 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Verse 11, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. 
Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, uh, nor do the churches of God. Amen. 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 So like I said, easy uh, group of verses. <laughs> You know, um, but you know, as, as many of you guys may have, uh, who, who was here this morning for, uh, come on, for Pastor Keith and Pastor Patty's message? They did such an awesome job of unpacking scripture, and, um, and I hope that you will stay till the end, all right? That's all I can say. Just stay till the end, because as we unpack, um, there's a lot here to unpack. And, uh, and I'm excited to do it. So let's go back to verse 1. It says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So basically saying, follow my lead as I follow my leader, my head. So Paul's basically saying, um, he's exampling to them what he's about to expect them to do. He's saying, follow me as I follow my head, Jesus. Okay? So he's literally saying... I'm about to, I'm exampling what I want you to do. Verse 2, he says, he commends their faithfulness in observing what they have observed from Paul's example. So they're getting some things right. They're not just like missing it. They're actually getting some things right. And he's like, okay, but there's still some things that I want to work through. So verse 3, Christ is the head of man. So let's unpack that. This is also said as Christ has the responsibility of all men um, or also of mankind. Um, And then man is the head of woman. So this is referring uh, to the marriage covenant. And um, as the display of Christ in the church, it can be unpacked in Ephesians 5. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Ephesians 5.23. Husbands are to be the spiritual leader of their household, which means... Uh, They are watching, they're listening, they're connecting to Jesus and ensuring that their whole family is doing so as well. Their uh, husbands are responsible not only for themselves, but also for all that happens under their care. Wives are to be under the care of their husbands. Another piece that uh, the head speaks to, don't, don't, it's going to be good. All right, so another piece, come on, it's going to be good, it's going to be good, yeah. Another piece <laughs> that head speaks to is leader. So when you break down a head, it's also leader. And so Paul is highlighting some key pieces about leadership. Leaders are responsible for all that their people do. So coaches, for example, are responsible for the outcome of their team. So if a coach and his team are losing game after game, what's going to happen to the coach? See, I, I saw it. You go like, he's out of there. He's out of there, right? We, we know that because he's responsible for what happens with his team. Did he lose the game? Did he maybe throw the pass? Well, yes, he did. Because though he didn't do it himself, he oversees with his leadership, and he cares for all that happens under his, uh, his care, on, on his watch. Because they're responsible for what happens on their watch, which is why Paul is saying that wives who don't cover their heads as a sign of respect or reverence, and that's what that was at the time. It was a sign of respect or reverence for their husband, and almost like wearing your wedding ring, as uh, Pastor Keith was talking about. See, I'm going to quote my sources this morning. (laughs) Hey, amen, come on. It can bring a negative reflection on their husband. Um, Okay, and now going to God is the head of Christ. Jesus unpacks this in John 5 which we will get to a little bit uh, in a moment. Um, I want to go back to head. It's, it can be defined as source or like the mouth of a river, um, where the flow goes from one thing to another. Paul's pointing out a consistent theme of carrying ourselves in honor as we choose to operate the way that God brings life. You know, basically he's saying this is the order that I've set up and it will usher in life or it will usher in the flow of heaven from heaven to the earth. So here, my goal with this message today, tonight, is to discern the function that God designed and emphasize the understanding from a biblical and heavenly perspective over a worldly perspective, which 
has the tendency to sterilize and dumb down or, or bring us to a level where we're actually reading Scripture from a worldly lens instead of actually taking the time to, to kind of come up and see how, how it was written, the context that it was written in, and what's the principle of the kingdom that God's calling us up to. So we can see it if we have eyes to see. And I, all, I, I mean, I, my eyes were open a lot this morning, so it's really good. So this order, it reminds me of another order in Scripture that can be misinterpreted. If seen from the wrong angle that Paul will bring up later in this series as we get to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 28, it says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. If we looked at this through the wrong lens, it says apostles are number one. Apostles are the best. Everyone else is second best. If not last, I win. You lose. Apostle is the best out of everyone. Okay, so if you're not an apostle, you you, you better just, you might as well quit. You know, you might as well just change your name to apostle and, and pray that you become an apostle. Okay? That's one way of taking it. All right. And then next up, the prophets grab the mic and they coined the phrase that I learned as a child. First is the worst. Second is the best. Third is the one with the hairy chest. Okay. All right. Anybody? Anybody? All right. And then the teacher would be like, no, it's treasure chest because they're third. Right. And, And the teacher would be like, you know, you guys are weak. I'm actually the only one that knows how to interpret the scriptures. And so... If you sit under my tutelage, you'll understand. Um, And then miracle worker. No, I'm just playing. You get the picture, right? But that's also why verse 28 that said that came after the 27 verses in chapter 12 that kind of really break it down. And and you really get the theme of it in verse 17 to 20. It says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the members of the body, every one of them according to his design. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So Paul gives the Corinthians a whole chapter about how one part isn't greater than the other, or more important, but how they all have important functions in the body as a whole, functioning Together. If I had a, a slide, I would call my message functioning together. All right, cool. So why then does, does it, like the verses we we're talking about today, say that the apostles are first, right? And, and the prophets are second and the teachers are third. Why is there an order? You know, it's, it's a and then and then and then. It's, it's like no more and then, you know. Um, anyway, all right. Okay, so as Danny Silk, right? was saying in Culture of Honor, Paul is highlighting the structure through which heaven flows to earth. He's talking about a specific functioning that is important. It's like PEMDAS in math. You guys know PEMDAS? Anybody? Everybody ever learn math? (laughs) Anybody ever learn math? All right, yeah. All right. Okay, PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S. It's uh, it's the order of operations. It's it's written in the book of uh, math. and God gave first parentheses, then exponents, then multiplication, then division, then addition, and finally subtraction, right? Okay. Uh, that's, I did. I did. I, I did have to read it because I've been forgetting that order for a while <laughs> until Facebook schooled me. You know, they got it. All right. Anyways. So, you know, nobody's out here claiming that parentheses is king over um, exponents or division. No one's out here saying that division uh, is the Lord over addition and subtraction. And no one is saying that subtraction is weak and the, the weakest of them all. Right? No one's saying that. Because that's not how it functions. It's an order of operations. There's a, there's a purpose to the order. Okay? So, they exist... And they have nothing to do with value uh, being over the other. It's not hierarchical. That was basically a long-winded way of saying what Pastor Keith was saying. Of It's not hierarchical. It's relational. 
I will quote you too, Sandy. I mean, Patty, I got you. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'll quote you too. You're like, get my name right. All right? No. It's it. Okay. Wow, this is going great. It's, it's my last time. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. Yeah. No, I'll just wait. Yeah. So good. But it's a, a specific function that flows. And the same is the true truest in the kingdom. You know, Paul's pointing out by showing that man was created first and woman was created for man. Therefore, pointing out an order, not in greatness, but in function. Man was created out of the dust and woman was created out of man. So that Tom Cruise's statement in Jerry Maguire of you complete me would have meaning. Wives complete husbands. I'm, I'm weaving it all in. There you go. The key, as Paul is saying, with the greater body of Christ in chapter 12 is that we are to be functioning from a place of unity and not division, which breaks the flow. Division breaks the flow. It breaks the flow through dishonor and selfishness versus walking in love, which edifies and builds up, as we talked about last week. And honor, which produces unity, and unity, which in Psalm 133, as we used to have a banner up here that says, brethren dwelling together in unity. And that, those, that chapter, it says, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity or dwell together. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mount, mountains of Zion. For the Lord has commanded, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Our honor for one another, our mutual submission to one another, our following of Jesus' example of yieldedness to the head causes the precious oil to flow and his blessings to be commanded on our behalf. So returning back to the verses that we look at today, Paul's emphasizing the importance of interdependence between men and women as they operate under Christ who operates under earth or on the earth under God the Father. So Jesus examples how he did this with his father in John 5, 19. It says, then Jesus, hey Esther, how's it going? All right. Then Jesus, come on, he answered and he said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. So just a couple key pieces. Jesus is a reflection of his Father. Jesus is dependent on his Father. Jesus has faith in his Father's love for him. The Father allows Jesus to see his work. He shows him all that he's doing. Jesus and his Father work together. The Father gives great responsibility to the Son and empowers him. There's no competition between Jesus and the Father. Jesus lives for the Father's will. And Jesus' validation comes from the Father. So if one were to contrast the way that Jesus operated under his uh, Father with how Lucifer operated with the Almighty. If you look in Isaiah 14, verse 13 to 14, it says, I will make my throne up with God. I will rise and be like God. It's this pride. 
It's this thing of rising up and establishing your own throne. And that's the difference between who Jesus was and who Satan is. Who Jesus is, you're like, what, is he not here anymore? No, who Jesus is too, and who, you know, that, that contrast between Jesus and the enemy. This thing of, I'm going to take it, and Jesus says, I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to come, and I'm going to come in humility. Paul is cautioning the Corinthians on the damage that can come from division because it mimics Satan's ways of self-promotion, pride, and dishonor versus God's way of life, honor, humility, and authority. Now, to the head coverings. Come on. All right. What we've all been waiting for. All right. Okay. Okay. So first off, all right, we're looking at verses 4 to 7. So first off, let's also acknowledge uh, what can sometimes be picked over here in verses 4 to 7. So I'm just going to go back up real quick and read that. Okay, so verse 4, it says, Every man who prays and prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Awesome. All right. So first, let's point out one thing that I think is often uh, not acknowledged that the first uh, two sermons were really good at pointing out, and I will do the same. Um, but it can sometimes be picked over if someone is trying to use this to uh, tell women to not be powerful or to not um, uh, play a significant role in the church or use this to twist. They're going to look over the fact that he actually said that women uh, pray and prophesy in church. And uh, when we pray, that, that's when you talk to God. When you prophesy, you speak for God. And when you speak for God, that, uh, that's not a, uh, a small thing. That's a very big thing. And so one thing that I want to just highlight with that is, um, you know, we, we can't pick and choose Scripture. We can't skip over and just say, well, that doesn't really fit. You know, Thomas Jefferson did that, and, and the Thomas Jefferson Bible is a Bible that was cut up because he picked out scriptures that just didn't really support how he saw it. But, you know, as I went and saw Bill Johnson one time, he's like, we oftentimes try to bend scripture to wrap around our lives, but uh, the goal is really to have scripture bend you. We should be bent by scripture. And, and, and if we have scripture that we don't really understand or we, we don't know how to wrestle with, then we need to take the time to wrestle with it, read a bunch of different commentaries like we all did this week, <laughs> And, and try to figure it out because there's some, some real truth in it always. Um, so uh, these two types of ministering, praying and prophesying, summarize what takes place in a worship service, which implies that women are just as much to participate and play important roles in church as men. So Paul's emphasizing the authority of women in the state, same statement that many may permit as justification for limiting the influence that women have in the church. Paul was emphasizing the differences of men and women. As was pointed out this morning, male and female, he created them. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and Paul wasn't shying away from it. He was actually emphasizing the differences. And I think that we should emphasize the differences because when you emphasize differences, you get double the value. But when you don't emphasize differences because you think that that's going to create unity, what you get is what God actually canceled out with the Tower of Babel because that was a tower that was being built with uniform bricks that were the same size, the same everything the same shape because it was easier to build with. And sometimes it's easier to build with simple things, but that's man-made at times because when we try to limit the, the diversity of who we are so that we can get along, that's actually uh, not God's uh, 
uh, example because his example is the temple of God, and, and that's built with living stones. And if you look at living stones versus bricks, bricks are ground down, put into a form, and it's controlled, and it's, and it's, uh, and it's within a controlled matter. But the Lord says, I'm the control. I am the control. Like, there's order, but you need to discern my order versus man's order to just kind of cut stuff off so that it fits. Because when we do that, that's, that's actually, honestly, in a lot of ways, what we're seeing today is we're seeing these differences that people don't know how to unify, so they're creating all of these uh, really uh, rules to, to deconstruct God's design. And they're, they're recreating it to create basically a counterfeit order that doesn't uh, actually equate to anything uh, but God confronting and God really breaking that down, just like he did with the Tower of Babel. Because when we think that we're going to rise up and do it on our own to spite the Lord, that's a bad place that you want to be. You don't want to oppose the Lord, okay? All right. We're all in agreement. And the church choir said amen. Okay, awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, head coverings for men. Uh, This could have specifically referred to the Greek custom um, for men to cover their head with a toga during pagan rituals. And so, therefore, it would have been uh, bringing worldly standards into God's house. I mean, in other parts of the Bible, um, Aaron was actually told to wear a turban before the Lord. So, it likely isn't saying, hey, take your hat off in in the house of God. Keep it on, Steve. Please, keep it on. No, so, <laughs> seriously, because it's not about an attire thing. It's not, it's not about take that hat off. Um, it, in many ways, what I, what I see this as is it's saying stop bringing the cultural norms of your day into the house of God. Stop being influenced by the culture and allowing that to shape your precious worship before the Lord. And then for women, head coverings in this scripture... You know, wives wore head coverings as a sign of respect to their husbands. That was just a norm of the day. It was also, um, you know, kind of a signified to say, like, I'm married. You know, it's, it's like, you know, so it's like your wedding rings on your head, you know. Um, <laughs> Paul also referred to, you know, head coverings as hair. You know, he, he, he referred to that and said, you know, it could have been talking about hairstyles just as much as uh, something to cover the hair. You know, um, the culture at the time likened unbound hair with uh, the maenads, as well as, um, you know, a lot of different other Greek gods, people who followed gods and goddesses and all that kind of stuff. But one specific was the, the maenads, um, who worshiped Dionysus, the Greek god of wine. Um, or as Patty today uh, shared, you know, there were prostitutes who uh, prostituted themselves. Into, in worship of, uh, of a goddess, and, uh, and therefore they cut their hair short or they shaved their head. Um, or if a woman was caught in adultery, then her head was to be shaved, and that would be a signifying of, of her immorality and, and basically a way to kind of publicly shame her. And so, um, and that was a part of the law at the time and all, all of that. And so Paul was basically like, hey, um, if you are to go with this cultural norm or allow this to influence you, you can, uh, you, you can bring shame upon your husbands. And, and we don't want to do this. Really what Paul was saying was not want the Corinthians to unnecessarily behave in culturally inappropriate ways. In both of these examples, Paul is talking about honor because he uses dishonor in both verses. We are to operate in honor, in, uh, which, as we discussed last week, considers others as more important than ourselves. Our actions reflect upon the one we are living yielded to. Children with their parents is one example. I've, I've, anyone ever been that child that probably wasn't really favorable towards your parents because of how you were acting? In the grocery store on aisle six. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah? Anybody? Okay. Been there. All right? Sorry, Mom. Okay. But check it out. Paul's also talking about authority here. 
Because when we talk about head, it's also talking about authority. Wives covering their heads was a sign of being under authority, as Patty really beautifully mentioned. I really recommend you guys going back and watching those two to fill in all the gaps. Um, So Matthew 8 is a beautiful picture of authority, and it's the centurion, a man under authority. So it says in Matthew 8, it says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found one with such great faith, not even in Israel. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Come on. So a couple pieces to that. Authority, authority figures emphasize the authority they submit to. Meaning one's authority comes from someone they submit to. And, and that's what he, he, he pointed out. He came to Jesus recognizing his authority over uh, all of the things that he had no authority over. And he said, Lord, please, please save my servant. And, and he came and he submitted under his authority. The centurion was a man of authority, but he recognized the limits of his own authority to do anything. The centurion's aim was to serve those under him and modeled what Jesus taught his disciples about authority. Whoever wants to be greatest must become the servant of all. You know, Jesus was unpacking this to them. He said, you know, in the world, they, uh, leaders, they lord it over other people. But if you want to be great in the kingdom, it's to come and serve all. Authority isn't a bad word when it is done right. As someone who is under authority myself, in Darren, I have seen and learned a ton and matured a great deal. Certain levels of growth that you can only get by submitting to someone else's authority. And you don't have to have the hardest conversations because <laughs> they get to do all that stuff, right? So you don't have to do everything because with authority comes a great deal of responsibility. But when we learn to submit under authority, we actually learn to grow because it's a kingdom principle that, that, that God's teaching us. Growth comes from honoring authority. It says, honor your father and mother, and it will go well for you. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And let me just say this. Rebellion from bad authority doesn't make the situation right either. So two wrongs don't make a right. Okay? All right. All right. So we're... We are to walk in honor and modesty because our actions towards others can give glory to God. How we carry ourselves matters. How we speak about God and about our spouses matter. How we live our lives as acts of worship matter. And as we walk our life in submission to God and those that God has put in authority over us, we glorify and honor God and not ourselves. And that brings about abundant life. So I want to point something out about brides and the bride of Christ. So um, it says that we, men or husbands, are to submit to Christ and actually that we get to mimic Christ, that we get to mimic him, that he uh, laid an example for us who laid his life down for the church and that we as men, we get to humble ourselves and follow, follow his example. And you might be like... Man, you guys are like the apostles. You guys get to, you get to copy Jesus. Jesus is the best, you know. I mean, you probably didn't say that. Um, but, but, but I want to point out something about wives. Wives are the example of all of us. Wives, as brides, are the example of the bride of Christ. 
that a wife and her ability to honor her husband is actually walking out a prophetic example for the whole body of Christ on how we can relate to Jesus. There's an incredible amount of weight because in that process, it's actually opening up a door of influence that, that really has the, the potential to change everything. It has the potential to, to cause us to say, yeah, I, that's something that I don't just get naturally. And so I was talking with my wife last night, and I was sharing it with her. She's like, wow, that's crazy, because who did the serpent attack in the garden? It was the wife. It was the wife. It was Eve. The, the serpent came to, to go after Eve, because if you have this uh, yes to the Lord, anything can happen. And so he wants to challenge those who would say yes to the Lord, the body of Christ. Amen. Still unpacking it, but there's a lot there. So, by Paul's exhortation, we stay protected by making our covering of Jesus visible. We all are the bride of Christ. And so we are to keep our head covered. And who are we covered by? We're covered by Jesus. And we are to live with a visible yes to the Lord so that everyone can see and not be confused or, uh, or uh, wondering whether or not we belong to Jesus or not because we're trying to fit in or because we're trying to deny him. Maybe that's why we're not wearing our veil. But we need to stay veiled, if, if that makes sense, before the world because it's an example of God's covering. And as we show his covering over us, he's the one who actually covers us. That, that he actually follows through with everything that he says he'll do, and he's faithful to it. Jesus is who we are married to. So the reality is, is, is men, we're the bride of Christ too. You know, so like, you know, there's that. So Vaughn, Vaughn if you want to come do your uh, piano stylings, come on, let's give it up to Vaughn, you know. You know, um, to me, this all refers back to Proverbs 3.34, James 4.6, and 1 Peter 5.5, which is God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If we want to be prideful and we want to approach it as men or as wives, as whomever we are, then, then there is a route for that. But it's not really a good route. When we humble ourselves and we come in humility, he lifts us up. He raises us up. You know, um, about five years or so ago, Darren led the church in an activation. He asked everyone to stand and close their eyes and said, there's a door in front of you. I want you to see the door in front of you. So I stood and I looked and I didn't see a door. I looked and there wasn't anything. Then I looked down and there was a door in the floor. And I saw the lamb look at me. He's kind of go like this. I don't know if he brought his paw up or something or whatever, you know, his hoof. And he said, come on. And then he went in and he invited me into the door in the floor. And, and so I engaged with it. And I, and I went in and, and, and I imagined like a tunnel being carved in the ground, just barely making my way through. And as I unpacked that in the days to come, I saw steps that led down. And even when we went to Korea, we had an underground church that we went to and we walked down these steps and halfway through down the steps, there was this little lamb, this, this lamb, just like an ornamental lamb there. And I was like, what, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> like, did you guys plan this, you know? And, and this lamb was there. And, and so I was like, okay, Lord, I'm paying attention. And I, I went down and, and as I kept meditating on it, 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 it started to grow and grow. And the more that I, I felt the lamb beckon me, I started to think about who is the lamb. The lamb is the one who was slain. 
It was Jesus who laid down his life, who entered in humility, who, who came and took the, the, the low road, who, who, who took the, the road of, of many sorrows and took the road of, 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 of facing the things all for our, our gain. And it was maybe a year later where I was being led through a prayer and they said, okay, now where's Jesus? And so I said, Lord, show me where you are. And I saw a picture of a lion, but it was a lion. It was the back of a lion. It was like the back legs and the tail and he was going up some stairs. And I realized at that moment that though we enter with the lamb, we exit with the lion. When we enter in that place of humility, he raises us up in triumph. When we surrender our control over the outcome, he comes in and takes it to a level that we could never take it on our own. And when we, when we lay our lives down and surrender to the Lord, our yes just became a ticket to a wild adventure that we have no control over. So I just wanna invite you guys to stand because this walk with the Lord, this walk of surrendering our life to Him is all about trust. It's all about trust. It's all about saying, Lord, I believe you are good. You know, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, she asks, the beaver is he is he safe is the lion safe and he goes oh no 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 he's not safe he is not safe but he's good he's good he's so good and he's so worthy of our trust and when we trust the Lord he will do things through us that we can never even imagine and so as I as I close us in prayer and as the ministry team comes I, I want anyone in here who's struggling to trust the Lord who's struggling to rely on him who, who, who maybe has a tight grip on something that God's saying hey maybe it's time to beckon I just want to invite you just come receive prayer there's amazing things that can happen tonight just by relinquishing that control and allowing the Lord to do something so Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you, God, that you are faithful. I thank you, Lord, that you are the lamb that was slain and you are the lion of the tribe of Judah, that you are the conquering lion that will come back and, uh, and set all your people into the new kingdom and it's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be amazing. But Lord, you're with us and you invite us on a journey of transformation to where we become just like you. We become risen ones who choose to go in the door and the floor, who choose to say yes to wherever you take us, knowing that you always, you always keep your promises, that you're always good and you always come through for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Sandy, do you want to wrap it up? Um, if the ministry, if you're on the ministry team, please come forward quickly. If if you also related to the beauty for ashes, I would love to pray for you. You know, don't want to embarrass. We don't want to embarrass anybody, but. Um, I would love to pray for you myself. Um, so just let me know if that was if that word ministered to you. Also, I just want you to know, um, thank you, Anthony. Uh, the way Anthony <laughs> talked, some of you may not know, uh, it's not like Anthony is going to die in two weeks and not ever come back. But uh, Aunt, God is calling Anthony and Rebecca uh, on an adventure. So they will be leaving us after nine glorious years here. And so more than likely, this would be the last time, but you never can tell, that um, Anthony would be preaching. 
so it's because of glory and not gory that he's <laughs> not, not going to be. So um, if, if you don't need prayer and if you're doing good, then God bless you. Uh, safe trip home, and we'll see you next week. Amen. <laughs>